one Wise Cracks Rick and Morty podcast. Wubba Lubba, hey! My name is Jared. I'm joined here with the Squanchers. We got Ryan. Sup, Squanchers. And Alec. Hey. So, do- so today we're breaking down season two, episode two of Rick and Morty entitled Morty Night Run. As always, let's get some first impressions. Let's start with Alec. I'm going to go a solid A. This episode's great, but it's not A plus like some of my favorite episodes. So do you say that like A plus is like the top tier? So like, you know, that's reserved for like the top three episodes. Yeah. I, I Yeah. Okay. It's, it's Me Seeks and Destroy, Tales from the Citadel, and maybe there's another one I'm forgetting about. Those are A plus. Okay. Cool. And Ryan? That's also my ranking system, too, by the way. It's just, it can't get any better. That's my A-plus system. See, I go by the DDR system, where S is, like, transcendent. But, like, A-plus <laughs> is still, like, you know, top-grade excellent okay. television. A-plus is my transcendent, and then A is just my normal man, excellent. But, you know, there was maybe a little room for improvement. And I give it the same rating as Alec, because I think this episode's amazing. And, you know, with all my complaints about the first episode of season two, I think they got right back on track. Mm. And I also like Midnight Run, the movie that they're... Oh, good. Uh, I'm glad. I have actually not seen it, so I'm glad that you've seen it, because I do want to talk about that a little bit. I, uh, I did a little bit of research on it, having not seen it. It's a good old Bobby D movie, Bobby De Niro. I'm mm-hmm. very close to him, so I just call him Bobby D. I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. I'm, I've never met Robert De Niro. Uh, cool. Yeah, I think this is a great episode. I don't usually give letter grades, but I think an A is uh, certainly fair. Um, I think that it's got a lot of really funny moments. It's definitely one of the darker episodes. It's got the Roy game. It's got uh, the return of Gearhead, which is, uh, you know, it's actually funny. Seeing this in chron- chronological order, they went back to Gearhead pretty quickly. It's only been one yeah. e- one episode without Gearhead, and then they're just back to it. Mm-hmm. Which well, I- there's a seat. There's a season break. Though. There's a season break, but you know, usually they don't go back and and reuse the same things that quickly. But you know, you're Gearhead being, made you're made a reappearance. Pretty uh, uh, insensitive to Gearhead. That's not his name. Oh, I'm sorry. His name is Revolio Clockbird Jr. Revolio Clockbird Jr. <laughs> yeah, I like that joke because it's like <laughs> it's like that's any less stereotypical. That's like saying you know you can't call me Jewy Katzenstein. My name is actually like Jonas Goldberg. <laughs> no, it's not because he, he makes it very clear. It's like Gearhead. Gear. No, head. I'm saying it's like this. They're both as Gearhead is. Yeah, he says calling just... me Gearhead is like calling me Asia Face. But Revolio <laughs> Clockbird Jr. That's... You might as well call him Gearhead. <laughs> <laughs> that's his specific name. He he's the only one that answers to that though. Everyone right. answers to Gear. Gearhead, if they're a gearhead, somewhere where no, no gearheads are. Okay. Well, anyway, yeah, good episode. Uh, this time watching it, I really, really liked the Goodbye Moon Men segments. I think oh, as I'm so good. as I'm rewatching the series, I'm I'm really growing very fond of those psychedelic elements, like in the uh, um, the Whirly Dirly conspiracy when mm-hmm. they have that time, that moment where they become time. Uh, that part is awesome. Well, I love the animation for that, but I'm glad you liked it because I don't get the Goodbye Moon Men part, like like, like the actual uh, line. Why does he keep saying Goodbye Moon Men? I don't know, but I don't care. Okay. Yeah, don't care. All right, well. It's uh, pretty <laughs> it's just, awesome. It's ridiculous. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I thought. But Also, like at first it's pretty good, but when he... When he whispers in that that cop's ears, and he's like, "What does he say? My life is bullshit." And then crashes. Oh, he says, one. "My life is a fucking joke." <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. it's like the music; it's like beautiful, but also fucking hilarious and sad. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, cool. Well, gentlemen, let's go into a recap. So, Jerry's unexpected presence on Rick's ship forces Rick and Morty to make a pit stop at Jerry Bury, a daycare a daycare center for Jerry's to do simple Jerry-like things with Jerry's from all over the multiverse. Morty has a crisis of conscience when he witnesses Rick sell weapons to a hitman named Crumbopulous Michael and uses the money to go to, go to an arcade called Blips and Shits. Jerry tries to escape the Jerry Bury, but eventually grows fond of all the Jerry-related activities, like a ball pit, making the stereo work with the TV, and a Beth birthday clown who gathers all the Jerrys to watch Midnight Run with director's commentary. Right as Crumbopulous is about to assassinate his target, Morty kills him with Rick's spaceship and releases the target, a mind-reading cloud known as Fart. Now being pursued by the Galactic Federation, Rick and Morty hide out with Gearhead on the Gear Planet while he repairs their ship. But Gearhead soon betrays them, and with the help of Fart, Rick and Morty flee the planet. 
When Jerry realizes he's not being held against his will, he tries to leave, but when the outside world proves to be too rough for him, he reluctantly heads back to Jerry Bury. Morty's about to return Fart back to his home world when Fart reveals that he's planning on wiping out all carbon-based life. So Morty is forced to make a tough decision and kill Fart, thus making all the death and destruction thus far all for naught. And in the end, Rick and Morty pick up Jerry at the Jerry Bury and head home. Or maybe it's the right Jerry? Not entirely clear. <laughs> I love that part. End of episode. <laughs> All right, guys, before we move on, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors over at Audible. So Audible is offering a free audiobook with a free 30-day trial if you guys go to audible.com slash squanch or text squanch to 500-500. As you guys know, Audible's selection of audiobooks, original shows, news, comedy, and more is unmatched anywhere. And it's the summertime. We're going to be wanting to curl up in our air conditioning and have something to do. So you're going to want to look for a book to listen to or this the beach. summer. Or, or the, the beach. beach. Or the beach. Absolutely. I mean, you know, not everyone lives on the coast like we do, but I hear what you're saying. I audible on the beach all the time, dog. <laughs> yeah. No, for real. That's the place to be when you're reading. I do it at the dog park. Reading at the dog park is good, too. Um, but since this is the episode, the episode we're talking about today reflects... So since the episode we're talking about today has one of the best Rick and Morty gags, the Roy game, I thought I'd recommend to you guys a book about video games. So there's been a lot of uh, some negative feed... So there's been a lot of negative news about video games lately. In fact, Alec and I have been following some stories on The Atlantic that suggest that video games are having a very harmful effect on our youth. Um, so I wanted to recommend a book by Jane McGonigal. And Jane McGonigal has two books. One is called Reality is Broken, Why Games Make Us Better and How They Can Change the World. And the other one is called Super Better, which is kind of a follow-up of similar ideas. What are they about? So Jane's idea essentially is that games are things that allow us to become better problem solvers. Not only do they allow us, do they challenge us and give us rewards for completing those challenges, but they also allow us to do this in groups. And so some of the big challenges of the 21st century are going to be A, problem solving, B, being willing and having the confidence to take on those challenges. And gaming is all about giving us that confidence. You know, you sure. think at one point, you know, oh my god, this boss is impossible, or this puzzle is impossible, but the game gives you the incentive to keep trying and trying and trying until you figure it out, and those are the skills that we're going to need for the problems of the 21st century, so that's the kind of things that uh, Jane talks about, and I think it's very refreshing to hear this very positive disposition on video games, because, uh, well, I'm curious, do you guys, like, uh, has gaming affected you in a positive way? Absolutely. I have a whole uh, uh, community of people I've never met before, but we're all friends. We play this game called, in virtual reality, actually, called Werewolves Within, um, where mm -hmm. you're kind of lying and backstabbing to each other. It's a really funny game. But yeah, you're all around a campfire, and I don't, I don't, I've never met these people, but they're awesome, and gaming did that for me mm -hmm. you know so i agree with i agree with jane probably what about you alec yeah it's interesting when i was like very young before i even picked up an economics textbook i was learning about economics through mmorpgs oh yeah and uh trying to make a lot of money uh just like dumb things not dumb things but like very simple things like supply and demand but more importantly like uh i'm one of the few people who still plays pokemon go oh yeah I and know you uh do. <laughs> I know I know a lot of people, you know, like depression, for instance, one of the problems is you're not motivated to to go outside and do things. Um, and because you're not going outside, you become even more depressed. So it's like a vicious cycle. And there's lots of people who are like, Pokemon Go got me to to go outside every day. You know, my depression's been a lot better. For some people, it helps them lose weight. I I don't quite know, but I suspect I maybe lost 15 to 20 pounds. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, Have you caught the ball? Also, uh no no i mean they also like keep releasing new ones so it's hard but you i've gotta got catch I've a lot of them but but yeah just like uh you know it's amazing especially i live in new york uh nobody makes eye contact ever no one talks to each other and when that game first came out i was like talking to more strangers than i've ever talked to uh strangers were talking to me and it was always like oh man did you see that scyther down the street like you gotta go get it <laughs> and so it was weirdly just like building this kind of like community uh in at least in new york and i'm sure elsewhere that was really Cool. So this uh, McGonagall book sounds like a like a, a, a sorry. Let me take that again. This McGonagall book sounds like a, a great exploration into things like that. And if I may say, so for all my personal and professional challenges, uh, Dark Souls is definitely something that gives me <laughs> it, it gives it inspires me because I mean there are some of those bosses in Dark Souls that are so hard and you try almost hundreds of times and eventually you beat it. And that's the kind of stuff that 
you know, if you play Souls, man, you can you you're priming yourself for a hard life. <laughs> <laughs> so check out Jane's book if you want to reflect on how gaming can actually enrich our lives instead of all those paranoid people saying it's bad for you. Check out Reality is Broken, Why Games Make Us Better and How They Can Change the World and Super Better, both by Jane McGonigal on Audible. So uh, Audible helps you listen to more books. You can switch seamlessly between devices. I'm talking your phone, your car from a tablet, Amazon Echo. You can get through tons of books while doing almost anything. And your books are yours to keep. So with Audible, you can go back and re-listen anytime, even if you cancel your membership. So once again, thanks to Audible for supporting the Squanch. Without them, it would not be possible to continue making these episodes. So get a free audiobook with a 30-day trial at audible.com slash squanch or text squanch to 500-500. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash squanch or text squanch to 500-500. And back to the show. All right. So uh, let's talk about the title of the episode first. So Midnight Run. So this is actually interesting. I think this is the first time the name of the movie is actually mentioned in the episode because Mm -hmm. the uh, birthday clown Beth says we can watch. Come on, Jerry's. We can watch Midnight Run with director's commentary, which is funny. And and it's also funny because if you've seen the movie, it has a very distinctive score that that they play like one half second of. So you know that they're watching the movie when they're all around there. Yeah, I haven't seen the movie, but hearing that score, it seems to be like very much in the vein. Is is it an 80s movie? Yeah. Like, uh, what's the movie Thief with, um, who's in Thief? Robert Duvall. Robert Duvall, yeah. yeah. And, like, that has, like, a very similar score. It's kind of like the 80s, like, it's like people a were doing, like, Tangerine Dream-esque stuff, like, you know, Risky Business. Yeah. It's not actually Tangerine Dream, but then there's Sorcerer. Those are both Tangerine very Dream moody movies. Very moody, kind of. But, yeah, like, you know, very synthy. Yeah. And even, like, Heat, to an extent, has that bit. kind of synthy kind of thing. So, yeah, I was, like, even though I hadn't seen the movie, I could, I could tell what time period action movie it was. <laughs> yeah. It's a uh, great but, movie, too, by the way. Everyone yeah, but see al- it. also it seems that it is also r- vaguely relevant to the arc of the episode. I was trying to think about that, because, yeah, w- in what way? So, De Niro's character, the character's name is Jack Walsh, he's a hired bounty hunter, and he has to bring an accountant named Jonathan Mardukas, played by Charles Grodin, to justice and bring him back to L.A., so we see that mm. there's a guy. So it's Crombopulous Michael. That's the sort name. of. I mean, they. So yeah, they're both bounty hunters, or I, maybe Crombopulous Michael's just an assassin, not a bounty hunter. But at the end of the movie, uh, De Niro has this kind of crisis of conscience where, in the end, he's supposed he's gone through all this shit. There's been all this backstabbing and all these like changes of factions, similar to what happens with Gearhead. And then ultimately, he finally gets Mardukas back to L.A. But at the end, he can't turn him over to the authorities, and he lets him go. And so I guess you could say that Morty's thing at the end with having to kill Fart is kind of an inversion of that is instead of like all the shit that he's gone through and instead of after all that shit finally liberating him, it's after all that shit now he has to kill them and, you know, classic Rick and Morty, it's, uh, okay. you know, very pessimistic and all for naught, whereas, you know, it's a much more positive message in Midnight Run. I, 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 I like the mess the seeming message of this of this film because it's totally opposite of what you usually get you know it's kind of reminds me of like 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 whenever rick is talking about hey look how all these look how fart killed all these people wouldn't have happened if you just let him if we just been at the arcade the whole time mm-hmm. like i love right. just it's seemingly saying don't don't try to act like a good person sometimes. Exactly. <laughs> There's even a line where Rick says, do nothing. Yeah. You know? uh, and I think that's the kind of the funniest thing about this episode is the moral of the story is don't try and do good, just do nothing. Just be at blips and chits and just uh, distract yourself and play the Roy game and don't worry yourself with any kind of any kind of justice because it'll just turn around and bite you in the ass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, the, the line is, at least all that death and destruction wasn't for nothing, you know? And that's when Morty sees the other Morty or, or Rick ask, and the other Morty didn't kill anyone because they're at blitz and shits all day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's I I love the I love I always love as a classic Rick and, Rick and Morty trope of them kind of taking any moral message and inverting it. And I think that this is probably one of the most clever. Yeah, and, definitely. Uh, probably the the darkest, but uh, it, it's it's similar to in Me Six and Destroy the 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 king that. You know, the, the, the poor village, but the king is a pedophile. So Morty did this whole thing to, to help the village, but really the guy was a pedophile. It's also similar to the Purge episode where, uh, you know, in, in theory, the 
the source of all this pain is that the elites, just like in the movies of The Purge, the elites are exploiting the lower class and keeping society under control by having them kill each other. And then even once Rick and Morty wipe out the upper class and then they leave the planet and then they just even without that oppressive class structure, they still devolve into killing each other. Right, right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, classic Rick and Morty. So I want to talk about the Jerry Bury. Let's talk about the Jerry Bury. First <laughs> did, of all, did y'all go to Jim Bury as kids? I did. Is that is that a uh, is Jim Bury is, 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 is it like a a chain of? Oh yeah. Okay. It's a chain of daycares, and it, there's kind of like a clown at the center of it. It's and. Yeah, you go and you're at Jimboree. You know, it's kind okay. of like Mother's Day Out or something. Yeah, see, I didn't know Jimboree was a chain or if Jimboree was like like a, a noun that describes like kid daycares. No, no. It, it, well, per- it might be with that too, but it's definitely a, a plural noun. Yeah, proper I, I noun, think I, I mean. went a couple times, but man, I was so young. Yeah. But I went all the time. My mom did. Or, Explains a lot, Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the woman who is like the giant pink lady who runs the Jerry Burry is so funny. How know, she's just right? like so <laughs> humiliating all the time. She's like, you're doing great when yeah. he's like trying to go into that hole and basically just t- uh, treating him like a total child. Right. Every time or, she opened her he... mouth, I was laughing my ass off. When he leaves, okay, you were always free to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So funny. Uh, so actually, so Alec and I were brainstorming about uh, a different video, uh, and we came upon this quote uh, from. So my favorite writer is uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky, and we came up upon this quote that uh, I think you know. W- a couple times in our episodes, in our videos on YouTube, we've talked about the difference between Jerry and Rick and how Jerry is kind of more or less the happy idiot and Rick is the tortured genius. And I came upon this quote from Dostoevsky's The Idiot, and it's his. It's a, it's a pretty famous quote. And it's, it's better to know the worst and be unhappy than to be happy and live in a fool's paradise. And I, when I was reading this quote, I, I felt like, and I don't know if this is intentional necessarily, but I really feel like... This dynamic that is like so to better to know the worst and be unhappy, that's Rick, or to be happy and live in a fool's paradise, that's Jerry. And it just made me think how many times in the show there is this recurring joke of Jerry being happy in a fool's paradise. So we have in this situation a Jerry Bury, which is essentially like, you know, for people with child minds you know eventually he finds himself very happy there very content he loves the balls he loves playing you know make the stereo work on the tv with the other jerry's he loves watching uh midnight run but there's also the chameleon simulation where it's a really poorly running simulation Uh, it's the happiest day of his life it's the happiest day in his life he wins the you've got apples thing so he's a a fool living or I'm sorry, he's happy living in a fool's paradise. There's also at the beginning of season three, there's the earth after it's been taken over by the Galactic Federation in a sense where he is a fool and he gets, you know, his six chewable salary and he's like this really successful man on the uh, on the basis of the fact that he does nothing. And then finally, uh, Pluto, when it's inhabited by science <laughs> deniers. That's right. You know, and, and now it's because he has, you know, no intellectual capacities and is basically just a sellout. He is once again a happy man in a fool's paradise. So you, you're you're forgetting though. My favorite after rewatching it, doing this podcast, is his coin collection and the coin collection. Exactly. Yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. So, do I think that this Dostoevsky quote was on Dan Harmon's mind? No, but I find that it works extremely well to like this constant joke of Jerry. Not only is he stupid, not only is he a fool. But when you put him in a place where fools reign supreme, he is so happy. <laughs> <laughs> is he v- really happy, though, or does he just have this illusion that he's succeeding and that things are good? Like, it doesn't seem like he's, like, the happiest person. There's always still, like, this kind of sadness, I feel like, behind him that he yeah. knows that he's an idiot and he's no Rick, you know, like... Yeah, he's yeah, happier than he, Rick would be in those situations, but I don't feel like he's just like, man, life fucking rocks, and this is it. This is the end-all, be-all. Um, so, it, I mean, some of these things. So the Shemalian simulation with the Hungry for Apples, I do think he's actually happy there. Okay. Would you agree with that one? Yeah, probably, yeah. Okay, so for the Jerry Bury, uh yeah, I mean, I can see where you're coming from. He does try to leave. He doesn't want to be like the other Jerry's, but... I mean, ultimately, he does have a nice time whenever he's kind of just accepting it. Yeah, nice time. Not yeah. necessarily he's it, like overcoming it's like, ecstasy. 
his his like sadness is usually i think about his like inability to control like things around him so like rick kind of taking charge of the household he's very upset about all the time Uh but it's like when that's taken away and he's able to really like take in all of the joy of his dumb coin collection or you know have sex with his simulated wife or win this fake award that he's like yes this is this is what it's all about but the point is, I think in all of these situations, Rick would not be able to be happy. Right. Yeah, whereas, I agree with that. Whereas yeah, Rick can't, I'm sorry, Jerry can, which I think is more to the point, is that yeah. is that there are situations in which Jerry can be happy, and they just so happen to be situations in where, you know, he's surrounded by fools, or at least uh, valorized for being a fool, uh, and, you know, I don't think Rick can really be happy until unless he's on the Unity world and he's just doing drugs and getting fucked up and having crazy orgies. <laughs> I agree. And, and, and I feel like we've talked, we've had this conundrum before. We've talked about it and what, which we would prefer, right? I mean, yeah, let's I, go around. I firmly said that I'd be on the Rick side because I feel like you can okay. free will yourself into happiness even though you know everything so on, sucks. Well, I mean, is but, that but, an but, option? But, that's well, not well, a third no, I mean, option. <laughs> so, I mean, you can make that option, but that's not quite what he's saying. What he's saying is that, like, it's better to be unhappy and know the worst about the world than to be a fool and be happy. So, if you're happy and you know the worst in the world, well, then that's not one of the choices. Okay. Well, then, yeah. I, if if I have to be unhappy, I'd rather be unhappy. You'd rather be unhappy. Know everything. What about you, Alec? You know, I feel like intellectually, I want to say that I'd like to be Jerry and just, but that's not true because every day I have the choice to log on to Twitter or not to log on to Twitter. <laughs> and every day I log into Twitter and read some shit that like speaks to how fucked up the world is. And I just do it the next day. <laughs> so God. Yeah. You know, I, I wonder what Dostoevsky would say about Twitter because like when I, when I think about like, you know, knowing the worst about the world, I, I, I don't even think about that kind of shit, but man. Yeah. Okay. So in the world of Twitter, in the world, in Dostoevsky's time, I'd be the first guy. I'd be the Rick. But in the days of Twitter, man, I, I'm Jerry any day of the week. <laughs> Get the Twitterverse out of my fucking mind. I can't stand Hell that Hell is other people and Twitter. I, I think, yeah. yeah, that's right. We should, that's what we're going to do. Next Wisecrack uh, project is we're going to, we're going to rewrite No Exit and it's going to be Hell is Twitter. <laughs> well, Twitter is other is people. Is it like you only have three And Russian trolls. Or three <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one's a Russian troll and one is the opposite political ideology of you. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. All right, guys, before we move on, want to announce the winner for our handmade pickle Rick contest that adult swim has, uh, has been sponsoring us on. So the winner, and if you guys remember the, prompt was to send us a tweet with your best idea for a Rick and Morty episode, and then if you win, if we like your thing, we will send you a handmade Pickle Rick straight from Adult Swim, and we got some great submissions. If you want to hear us read all the submissions we got, make sure to check us out on Patreon at wisecrackplus.com. You can see a video of me, Ryan, and Alec reading all of them and laughing and wondering what they would all be like, but (laughs) today's winner is Edward Hunter, at Edward J. Hunter. Good job, job, Edward. Good job, Edvard. So, here's Edward's pitch. He says, Jerry takes Morty and Summer to visit his parents, who now live in a retirement home, and Rick very reluctantly ends up tagging along. Once there, Rick notices how most of the elderly people there are lame, miserable, and lonely, so he mocks them, until Summer reminds Rick that he's actually the same age as some of these people there, reminding him of his own mortality. Morty suggests Rick use his technology to improve the lives of the elderly, and Rick makes a fountain of youth, a la the movie Cocoons. However, this backfires as the residents come to realize that being young again actually sucks. You have to get an entry-level job that doesn't pay well, you you can't use your senior citizen bus pass, etc., and they beg Rick to change them back. But Rick explains he can't do this because the, the fountain only works one way. Rick suggests that they wait it out and return... Rick suggests they wait it out to return to their former ages, but the residents are no longer patient enough, so they riot. Jerry comes up with the idea to get them all to smoke 60 times a day and embrace their unhealthy habits, so within two months, they're back to normal. Morty is bemused that Jerry's ridiculous plan worked, but Rick explains that the writer wrote himself into a hole and needed an easy out. Rick claims not to have learned anything, but privately, he has come to terms with his future and his mortality. End of episode. A plus episode right there. The thing that I like the most about this, the the potential for this episode, is that you hear a lot, at least among the adults that I talk to, is that I think there's this general 
acceptance among adults today that it sucks being young today more than it did for their generation <laughs> with social media and, you know, just the the economic situation being what it is. And I think it would be awesome if we see all these old people saying, oh, I wish I was young again. And then they're just like, who wants to be young in funny fucking 2018? Well, I think that that's a problem throughout history, you know, like old people have always been like, oh, young people today, they don't know how good they got it, you know, compared to us. But now it's kind of like it's the opposite. Well, yeah, uh, in, in, in a way. I think way. most parents know that if I was in middle school at the time of Instagram, like all my teenage angst would be amplified a thousand yeah, times. Right. I, I, uh, I, I you'd feel become a monster. I feel horrible for anybody who is currently in middle school right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good luck out there. Yeah. So I think that, I think this would be smart sci-fi social commentary. So congratulations at J- Edward J. Hunter. You will be getting your handmade pickle Rick straight from Adult Swim and straight from the heart of us at Wisecrack. <laughs> and a very current reference with Cocoon there, you know, with solo director Ron Howard. Mm. Right? Very nice. <laughs> All kinda, right. Kind of. And back to the show. All right, guys, let's talk about one of my favorite gags, the Roy game. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's it's better this time watching it. It is so good. Absolutely. Uh, so we had recently made a video about Rick and Morty and Archer and this Verve show called Gary and His Demons where we talked about subjecting the fantastic to the mundane. And this is a perfect example of that. There's a video game, and you know, video games are you know supposed to be fantastic, escapist, high concept, super... Uh, adventurous and this one is literally like playing the life of a man whose existence is soul crushingly common you know he has a common childhood peaks in high school marries the cheerleader then fails professionally and then has to be emasculated by running his father-in-law's carpet store now wait a minute then beats cancer i mean that's just wasn't that just morty's uh play of the game couldn't you make couldn't you theoretically take roy and be anything that's ever existed i mean he's a a blank slate he's a blank slate but, but that's the funniest part because rick you know, being yeah. the most rebellious badass, the be- the most rebellious, crazy thing he can make Roy do is burn his social security card. Well, no, that's just the beginning yeah. of the thing because he's like he's off the grid. I mean, that's just the beginning of Roy's life. You know, he was probably just born, and then Rick is taking him rogue immediately, and he's gonna go do but, some but fucked up shit. He was thrashing thing. his score. But the most fantastical thing we can think of is to. To take him off the grid by not having a social security number. I think right. that was funny. I, Rick, Rick even I, I gathers an audience, <laughs> you know, of like, oh my God, yeah. he burned his social security card. You know, another thing about this is it's just mind blowing to think that Morty has lived like a whole lifetime inception <laughs> style. You know, in terms of Morty's perception, is he actually experiencing it in a montage like we see it, or is he actually living oh, a I like whole to think lifetime? He led, he no, led no, an entire time. life. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I like to think too. Yeah. Especially like when he comes he's, out, he's like, Where's my wife? You know that right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's so disoriented. And I also just want to point out this is the plot of a Star Trek episode, and that I'll just leave it there. <laughs> is it? Yeah, I think that all sci-fi films in the last decade can basically be boiled down. Star Trek did it, kind of like Simpsons did it, <laughs> right? Well, I, I would, I wouldn't be surprised if they're inspired in this episode. Um, Patrick Stewart like gets sucked into an alien satellite that like makes him live a life on their dead planet, you know, before it was dead. And then like he snaps out of it and was like, holy shit, I just like grew into an old person died. And now I'm back where I was in like two seconds past in in the real world. Right. It it was amazing how well the montage was of of Morty's Roy play because you really felt for his Roy character, you know, like you, you knew everything about him without a word being spoken. His name, his nickname was Rocket. He was good in football and, you know, the whole thing. Yeah, because it's playing on like a series of cliches oh, right. that we've all known and have yeah. been I was used for decades. Yeah, yeah, me too. I mean, <laughs> it was, uh, it was, and I think that's what makes the joke all the darker is the fact that it is so sentimental and like almost authentically sentimental. And then when you come out and you realize like, oh, it's just a game. He got a decent score yeah, or whatever. Got a <laughs> shitty score. Even before that, I thought one of the funniest things is he beats cancer. And then the next scene, he dies from slipping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It's... The most <laughs> the most boring, like unremarkable death ever. He just is trying to get a carpet, slips files and then game over. And then it's yeah. awesome when like a scene later when uh, when Morty comes crashing through the ceiling he's like he's still like muttering to himself he's talking like, about persian, persian carpets yeah, like, persian yeah, rugs? yeah oh my god <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i wonder if it's one of those things where do you think 
like maybe I don't even know what concept I'm about to speak about, but like let's say that you're like Morty and you live this whole lifetime in this in this game. If you're like, and it, it feels like a very long time, but does like the relativity of time, like if you're like Rick and you, let's say you've played the game, the Rick game, like or I'm sorry, the the uh, Roy game, like 50 times, does it? <laughs> feel like less time over time like no i bet it feels i bet he literally just gets off i'm like yeah i'm about to spend 70 years here just but i just want to beat my score you know like uh he probably gets off on it somehow because he's a fucking well, well, crazy person well there is like as you get older time seems to pass faster like you know <laughs> when you're a kid a year is like an eternity and maybe it's just because you You've only lived like four years. So like, of course, one year is a quarter of your lifetime. But yeah, if you've lived hundreds of years, is that fucking with your like current perception of time? Probably. I, yeah, I, I just think it would feel shorter every time you play the Roy game. But it, yeah, it feels shorter yeah, in, in the sense that in the too. sense that wow, I went to Disneyland all day. That didn't t- that it, it, time really flew. Right, exactly. <laughs> but not like not like biologically. Like whoa. Uh, well, it's hard. I don't even know what's happening biologically. You know, it's like, I it. in, a, in a sense, it's always just. Uh, we're, I was going to say it's a perception of time, but that we can only perceive time. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, let's move on to Crumbopulous Michael. Oh, I this love guy, him. Yeah, best, yeah, best the, character in the Best episode. character, yeah. I mean, this episode is some fucking classics. He just classics. loves killings. I have no code of ethics. I will kill anyone, anywhere. Children. <laughs> and he has like a business people. card. It's really sad that he killing. died so quickly because I'd love to see him come yeah, back. Yeah, what the fuck, Morty? I thought you weren't into killing people and he just kills Crumbopulous Michael like it ain't no thing. I'd like to. Did, uh, oh, sorry. Keep going, what? I, know, I was just going to say, does anyone notice his business card has a Twitter and Facebook icon on it with a hashtag? Oh, see, that's amazing. I'm glad you brought up his business card because after watching this episode, I realized I have Rick and Morty Munchkin, right? And I happen to have my Munchkin. They have the... Sorry, what's the, Rick and Morty Munchkin? Munchkin's this amazing role-playing card game that I highly uh, recommend anyone playing if you're into that kind of thing. But they have a Rick and Morty ver- version, and it plays with the show so well. And if you're watching the Wisecast, you can see that all of the play- Player cards look like Cr- Crumbopulous Michael's business card, oh, and that's just like a, a callback to this one episode in this one detail. Oh, that's amazing! Isn't that cool? Yeah, yeah. But he's unfortunately not a character. You can be Mister Poopy Butthole, though. Oh, nice! But, uh, yeah. Um, I actually saw at GameStop the other day they have a Rick and Morty. It's called, I believe it's called the Rick's Must Be Crazy board game, but it's not Munchkin. It's like its own thing. No, it's hmm. Close Encounters of the Rick. It's it's the name of an episode, and it's awesome. I don't really know what the game is, but I mean that Rick and Morty merch is rolling out, <laughs> man. Um, but yeah, so, so we're talking about earlier how the Roy game is a classic example of subjecting the fantastic to the mundane. I think this is another classic Rick and Morty inversion where they pr- portray like the nefarious as overly civil, you know, <laughs> and he's so mannerly and he's so polite. Uh, he gives him a business card. Uh, and just in the kind of language that you would use in a professional manner, he ensures Morty that he has no code of ethics. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. <laughs> That's yeah. my favorite line. I have no code of ethics. And I just I'll yeah, just, oh, here I go killing again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and I just love that that scene of him infiltrating. It seems very like Metal Gear Solid inspired. <laughs> of, of well, well, one thing that that struck me before Crombopulous Michael is almost the inverse. So. Morty says, what kind of business do you do in a garage? You know, this seems a little shady. And Rick says, right, like nothing shady ever happened in a fully furnished office. You ever hear of Wall Street, Morty? You know what those guys do in their fancy boardrooms? They take their balls and they dip them in cocaine and they wipe them all over each other. <laughs> <laughs> and then later, like a, like two lines later, more to this idea of the, the episode saying that the most virtuous thing to do is to do nothing Rick even like teases this a little bit because he says when Morty reprimands him for uh, selling a gun for money, he says, yeah, but this isn't just money. This is, I can't remember what the name of the currency is, where it's like Flarbatrons or something like that. He said, do you you know what kind of good two people can do with all these, what, what were they called? Flurbos. Flurbos. Do you know what, like, what, uh, you know, 400 Flurbos can do? And you think he's about to say, like, feed a starving planet or something (laughs) like that, but then he just goes, go to Blips and Chits! (laughs) So, uh, yeah, like, even earlier than uh, when Fart is established, there's the whole, like, teasing 
do do gooding, whether whether it be with your actions or with money. It's the whole episode is what like a it's a a joke about ethics almost, right? Yes, and 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 and, <laughs> and, 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 and if you think about it, I know Crumbopulus Michael has no ethics or no code of ethics, but he was doing technically the right thing by killing Fart, right? Because yeah. Fart was going to destroy our whole galaxy. Well, Fart says. Earlier on in the episode, he says to Morty, he says, you're not like other carbon-based life forms. You va- you put the value of all life above your own. I mean, you could argue, like, like in a sense, Fart makes the Agent Smith argument from the first Matrix when Agent Smith is like, uh, there is another organism on this planet that follows the same pattern. Do you know what it is? A virus. Human beings are a cancer on this planet, a mere plague, and we are the cure. <laughs> <laughs> Does it bother you that... You know, you know that entire scene. What <laughs> does, does, does it bother me? What <laughs> that viruses and cancers are two different things. <laughs> uh, yeah, I might be mis, I might be misquoting the movie slightly, but um, well, I po- have point a strong letter, worded letter to write. If so, uh, but point being, Alec, that uh, <laughs> <laughs> that I, I guess you could argue that uh, if human, if carbon based life forms really are having a harmful effect on the life in the multiverse in general then who is the right person oh so you're saying okay you're, you're taking farts point of i view. mean if we are being like so utilitarian that like you know the the amount of good for the most amount of people in the multiverse and by killing all carbon-based life other forms of life will flourish then i don't know there's a question there the hitler point of view is it? I was going to say Thanos, but I think they're yeah. all related. <laughs> they're, all re- they're all related. <laughs> uh, similarly, let's talk about, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but the part where Fart conjures an image in the cop's head of his best friend fucking his girlfriend, and then he goes, <laughs> my life's a fucking joke, and then he right. crashes into it. That's uh, pretty dark. <laughs> yeah, there's, totally one, there's one there. little fart thing I wanted to bring up, which mm-hmm. is, I feel like somewhere I, we've gotten an email about Morty's foot fetish, but I could be wrong, or maybe I've read it somewhere. But um, when when Fart is first speaking English, he's like, I communicate through Jessica's feet. I mean, telepathy, because yeah. he's reading Morty's mind, and Morty, is, he's like searching for the word in Morty's mind, but all he can come back with is Jessica's feet. Right. I thought, I think that's something we should pay attention to in the future. Are there other feet related things that Morty fantasizes about in the show? I don't know. I feel like I read somewhere that there was, but now I can't recall them. Google there, there has been bitch. speculated that he's a redhead fetish. Oh, well, I think that, that that's confirmed because in the Morty's Mind Blower episodes, uh, there's one of the sketches is Rick says like, oh, this is a super magnet. Basically, you just like make a wish and then it magnetizes the things that you want or your desires. And then like that's when like Morty's in the garage and like 600 redheads just like start gravitating right. toward the thing. I and mean, they're all redheads. Plus in the... Uh, in the toxicity episode, the girl that he ends up at the end when uh, when Rick reinserts the toxic version of Morty inside him with the syringe, Morty is in like his really nice penthouse apartment that he paid for by being like a Wolf of Wall Street dude. But the girl that he's living with is also a redhead. I right. think I think that the redhead thing is pretty established. Huh. Never noticed that. Shit. Yeah. So, I, so I, 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 redhead. I liked how Fart read Rick's mind and it just said, get out of my head, Fart. Blah, right. Blah, blah, blah. right. Yeah. Interesting. He's not, He's been around to Fart before, yeah. Rick. Yeah, the Goodbye Moon Men thing, if we could just talk about that again for a second. I mean, I don't really have anything other to say than I love the animation. So good. I hope that that also becomes a trope where once in season three we got that psychedelic animation thing and happened in season two. I hope to see it again in season four through ten or whatever. But no one can answer why Goodbye Moon Man, right? There, there's no – that's not a call but there reference to something. There was an animation of Moon Man, but – Yeah. But well, what does that have to do so with the plot? it sounds like a David Bowie song to me, but I know it's that guy from um, – what's that band? Fly to the, the Concords. Concords. Yeah, Jermaine Clement. Do they always sound like David Bowie or is it supposed to be – they? That's what I was wondering if it's a direct reference to a specific song, and I just don't get it. But uh, yeah, I actually don't even know. I I did not look that up. Is this an original song or not? I yeah, I definitely I think it's an original song. But I'm trying to figure out like why why is it called Goodbye Movement? What does he say that for? And like dot dot dot, or or if it's just a reference to a real song. But uh, yeah, I don't know. 
I mean, I like the animation too, and I and I like that he's kind of what like kind of hypnotizing people or just getting in their mind and fucking with their thoughts and. Oh, I got I got some good shit on the uh, Wikia. Okay. Wikia, whatever the fuck it's called. Well, first of all, it's sung in the parody tribute and style of musical artist David Bowie. All right. Gotcha. It claims, and if anyone can verify this, it's written in the same key and uses many of the same chord progressions as Claude Debussy's Claire de Lune, which could be a possible <laughs> reference, seeing as how Claire de Lune is written about the moon. Uh, um, doubt doubt that, that all sounds that. like a huge stretch. But it doesn't say, it just says David Bowie, it just says... I mean, saying it's in the same key and... What was the other thing? Key and tone or whatever? Like, you could say that about... I feel like you could say that about a lot of music. Yeah. Bullshit. Yeah. All right. We're going to call bullshit on... It could be that they just wanted to use a David Bowie song and they couldn't afford it or something like that. No, I think that... I mean, Jermaine... Yeah, like you were saying, Flight of the Concords, they do all these kind of spoofy parody kind of songs. And so they probably were like, hey, let's do a David Bowie reference. I just still don't get why Goodbye Moon Moon Men. That's my only thing. But who gives a shit? Like I, like I said it. at the beginning. Yeah, it works. So let's talk about uh, getting the wrong Jerry at the end. So I feel like this is a, a thing that people often reference as some sort of uh, fan theory focal point. Like, oh, man, it's the wrong Jerry from here point out. I mean, in my opinion, this is just a gag. Like, Kind of like your th- that was your theory on the whole is is Beth a cyborg, right? It, uh, well, my... The thing with Beth being a cyborg is my answer is it just doesn't matter. Well, isn't but, that your answer to this? Uh, it doesn't matter. It's a gag. It's just well, to make I us think laugh. It does matter, like in the sense that all ensuing episodes after this one, the Jerry that we see is the Jerry that we've seen in all previous episodes. So it and does well, matter. Except, except before. The only time we get an actual different Jerry is after Rick Potion number nine. After that, it's the same consistent Jerry. I mean... So you do think that the Jerrys were mixed up at the beginning of that scene? <laughs> no, I, I mean... Logically. Either they're so similar. I just think for the purpose of storytelling and for the purpose of continuity, we're meant to believe that either it's the exact same Jerry or it's so similar a Jerry that we're not supposed to project any increased significance Well, that's crazy. It. That's a well, really yeah, that's crazy theory. Like Jerry's, are, Jerry's are fungible. They can just, like, be replaced. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? you think? Do you think that that's ever going to come back to relevance? I mean, I so. th- th- they've kind of said that they don't hide stuff. So, I mean, in a way, I agree with you that it's pr- like, but that a that a it's a gag first and foremost. But but I do think it matters, and that that by no, the so logic of like, the story, I do think that they were switched at the beginning. If we think that it's been the, it's the same Jerry, I right? think this is the same thing with uh, what was it the, the guy in that other Rick and Morty podcast who who had Ryan Ridley on, and he said that. He asked Ryan Ridley, like, what is the significance of Rick breaking the fourth wall and Rick knowing that he's in a cartoon show? And Ryan Ridley said, look, sometimes a gag is just a gag. Sometimes we're just doing something because it's funny. And I I would put this in that same camp. I would, too. But I think that sometimes they know they're very much aware of the gags that they can expand upon. And I can totally see them like at some point going, you know what, let's actually declare that, the, you know, that the Jerry was the wrong one the whole time or something. Or, or using, I don't think I don't think using that's going to happen. Things. I mean, they could probably, do it. Probably but I don't, not. I don't but, think but I think will. that they do kind of take the, the, the way that they've set up this very open, broad show and they play with it. And so I can see them taking what they've already set up and fucking, I just don't think that they it. can contextualize in any way in which it matters. I mean, the Jerry that we right. have after this episode is the one who's gone through all the most important arcs up until the point we're at now at the end of season three. Yeah. You know, I, at this point, if it is a different Jerry, I don't even give a shit what the old Jerry's doing, you know, because we've right. spent so much time and experienced so much growth with the new Jerry. So I just can't imagine how they would make that relevant other than it just being a pure Easter egg. Well, the 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 Beth thing I could see coming back because that yeah, the, that's different. That's the cliffhanger that we're left with right now, right? Um kind of. Well, one thing... go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's okay. I don't I don't I don't want to talk about clone Beth. Yeah. <laughs> that's fine. Uh one thing that I think is maybe worth speculating is that on the little sheet that Rick fills out, first of all, there's uh like Rick's dimension and Rick puts C137. And it says Jerry's dimension, he puts uh, N-A, so not applicable or not any. But also there's like a little drawing of Jerry and it's like indicate any physical damage, almost like a car rental if anyone's done that. And he, uh, you know, there's like a little scribble on his head like he has head damage. And I don't know if that's a joke that Jerry's just dumb or maybe, you know, something happened to Jerry. I I think it's just 
Rick making a joke about his intelligence and just fucking with him. Yeah. I, I, I would put that whole sheet under just a gag. And as far as the non-applicable, I don't know. I mean, what what would that even possibly reveal? Uh, that Jerry was created out of space time. <laughs> Jerry's a god. I'm making things up. I'm yeah. just throwing shit at the wall. I mean, who knows? It could be that turns out that the after Rick Potion number nine, they haven't been in an actual dimension. They're in a simulation, so the NA doesn't work because he's not a real Jerry. Wow. I mean, that could, that could, season, be, could be, but I doubt it. <laughs> I think more than anything, they probably just didn't want to reveal the name of the dimension that they're currently in. Because C-137, I suppose, and once again, this is also up for interpretation, I suppose is the one pre-Rick Potion number nine, uh, but they've never named the one post-Rick Potion number nine. Actually, no, I believe that it actually is C-137 that's pre-Rick Potion number nine, because Morty refers to himself as C-137. So we know that the one before Rick Potion number nine is C-137, but we don't know what the one after it is, and I guess they just didn't want to commit to giving us an answer. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, let's go into the mailbag. I believe that Alec has some questions picked out for us. I do. And if anyone would like to send us any questions, you can hit us up at squanch at wisecrack.co. Again, that is squanch at wisecrack.co. So just a couple today. Uh, we got one from Nicholas. First of all, love all your shows. Just the right amount of philosophical overanalyzing that my friends and I like to indulge us with at parties and small doses until we're forced by societal pressures to join others. I'm so sorry that you're forced to join others. I really feel for you there. Um, secondly, in your episode about a in time, I love to hear you get the principle of Schro Schro sorry, Schrodinger's cat right. Uh, what I didn't hear mentioned is the misconception that the cat is meant to illustrate the Copenhagen interpretation and that Schrodinger's thought uh, the cat was both dead and alive. He set up the thought experiment precisely to show the absurdity of the prevailing interpretation of quantum mechanics by stretching the application from the subatomic with the atomic decay to a macroscopic object. Obviously, a cat can't be uh, both alive and dead, uh, but this is implied in the experiment if the Copenhagen interpretation is correct. I'm just going to pause real quick. The uh, Copenhagen interpretation is like a specific way of looking at quantum mechanics and that you know a object a, a wave can be or sorry that these two superpositions can exist uh, and then collapse when we observe it anyway um he continues nicholas uh the colloquial understanding of schrodinger's cat may be uh parallel to the meta commentary of rick and morty itself the show like the thought experiment uses scientific ideas and inventions and extends the possibilities for uh, an unserious end product. Contrasting this with a lot of the fan base of the show who claim the show is scientifically smart and that you can have uh, have to be intelligent to get it and all the sci-fi technology and concepts. In a way, like Schrodinger's Cat, the fan base has used the show to showcase precisely what it is critiquing. Thoughts? Uh, that's Nicholas from Sweden. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas from Sweden. So he's saying that just as Heisenberg was trying to show, I'm sorry, Schrodinger, uh, Schrodinger, Schrodinger was trying to show that there was a kind of absurdity to the current study of metaphysics. In a sense, the episode is also revealing the absurdity of the fan base that thinks that you actually need a heightened understanding of these concepts in order to appreciate it. Yeah, and let me just, the Copenhagen interpretation is, again, things can exist in these multiple states before we observe them and they collapse. And Schrodinger was like, that's bullshit. Um, here's an example of a cat. Obviously, a cat can't be alive and dead. And what he's doing is he's taking it ad absurdum. He's like, look at this in, like insane thing. Whereas Rick and Morty, yes, they take basic principles and just draw them to their absurd conclusion. And again, like, it's not even even that, like, you know, the whole uncertainty episode isn't based in Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. It's not based in these things. It's just drawing it out absurdum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very meta point. I like oh, it. Yeah. Very meta. Cool, Nicholas. All right. Next email is from Thomas. Hey, guys. Great podcast. 
I am late coming, but is nonetheless an excellent listen. As I went through the back episodes, I heard you talk about the devaluation of the galactic currency in Rick Shank Redemption. As a current PhD student in economics, I felt I should write in to share why this isn't possible. When a government issues a currency, aka fiat currency, shout out to Alec, who nailed it, uh, <laughs> they can only determine the quantity of money, not its value. The uh, the value fiat money has is what you get in exchange for it. The relative value of a dollar is determined by its users and can only be measured in relative terms like how much you can buy with it uh, of Japanese yen, Bitcoin, or wafers. In this way, Rick cannot change the absolute value of a currency because it has no absolute value. However, if the money is exclusively in digital form, he should have just deleted the entire quantity, having the same effect in the episode. Peace among worlds, Thomas. But wait, weren't you saying that it did make sense? And I was saying that how could, yeah, how could you just centralize like the, or how could you affect the faith that people have in money just by turning a one into a zero? You know, I'm going to get in, a, in an internet fight with Thomas, uh, even though he's clearly far more educated in economics yeah, than dude, me. Yeah, don't, dude, don't, don't go down that rabbit hole. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to lose, bro. No, no. <clears throat> I think like, uh, you know, Thomas is, there's like this idea that the the quantity of money, you know, the government can issue a quantity and the more quantity is things like inflation happen. But that's like what our government does. They're like, we're creating, you know, a million new dollars and they're trying to, to make sure that they don't create too much more money that all of a sudden it's worth nothing. If Rick, you know, it doesn't show him doing this, if he just like, create an infinite supply of money it would reduce the value to if not zero at least like oh, okay. approaching zero right so he could so, have, so he, that, he could have just if it was a digital currency or something like that or even if it was a print currency he could just issue so much money that the that the dollar becomes virtually worthless yeah and also i don't really know how this works so thomas if you want to write back but there's governments like China, and I don't know if they do this anymore, but they would determine the value of uh, their currency by pegging it to the dollar. So they would say, you know, uh, one of our, uh, you know, units is worth, you know, $2.4 or $0.67. I'm making all the numbers up here. Uh, so sometimes in that case, they're, at least in the exchange, obviously that may uh, not be able to control how much bread people can buy with it and stuff like that. But, you know, there, there's stuff that happens there. So, Thomas, if you want to actually clarify that. But, yeah, I really appreciate the email. Basically, there's lots of ways that Rick can manipulate the currency system without, you know, by, by basically manipulating the entire supply. Right. I guess if we if Rick were to say instead of like instead of it becoming worth one of itself rather than or zero of itself rather than one of itself, if it would make more sense if it was this currency was worth one of some other currency, but now it's worth zero of that currency, then and if that was the only measurement by which the currency was given value, then it might be more accurate. Yeah, interesting. Thanks, Thomas. That was cool too. Yeah. Uh all right. The next one is from Aton. Hey, um, hello, Wisecrack Dudes. My name is Aton. First off, your show is great. When I first decided to listen, I ended up listening to 17 episodes in two days. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, my God. You probably know me very well now. <laughs> <laughs> he hears your voice in his sleep. Um, Poor bastard. So uh, I, I just wanted to bring up one of uh, Aton's uh, questions, which is, are there multiple citadels of Rick? At one point, the Citadel is referred to as the multi-dimensional Citadels of Rick. I think it would make sense if there was only one. However, during the presidential debate in season three, episode seven, juggling Rick says that the Citadel is the best Citadel in the entire uni in the entire multiverse. This implies that there are indeed many Citadels. Perhaps it doesn't matter, but it seems like a contradiction. What do you guys think? You know, we're getting a lot of these emails about the nature of infinity, and I think that they're all wrapped up in that question. And basically the, the the experts, the math people who have been writing us in have suggested that there actually is a finite number of, inter of ways of interpreting infinity. So we don't necessarily have to believe that there are infinite amounts of citadels. Now, whether there's more than one, I don't know. I mean, I could – I mean, I, I'm torn. On the one hand – Well, either there's one or there's infinite. It feels like those are the two options. Well, then I don't think that there's infinite. I think that there's no, – why not? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. Why? Why? Um... It kind of seems like it defeats the purpose of the multiverse like hub if you have more than one. Right. Because where? Yeah. Where are all those Ricks and Mortys coming from? I mean, if it would if there was one Citadel that 
ruled its own universe. Well, there's only one Rick and Morty per universe, so... Okay, well, I think that... Let's just say you have an infinite amount of Ricks, and, like, ten of them get together, and, like, we're going to make a Citadel of Ricks, and then they recruit, you know, a hundred thousand more Ricks. Because there's an infinite, another hundred could recruit another million or two million or whatever the amount is. It seems perfectly possible sure so there's like citadel of rick one citadel which is like for the first hundred thousand universes and there's citadel of rick two which is for the next hundred thousand universes well it seems like these it seems like the uh citadels would have to be on entire other planes of existence (laughs) or i mean there could just be the designated universe okay yeah or you know (laughs) uh yeah I don't know, bro. I don't, yeah, I don't yeah, know. I want, to, I want to see Citadels of Rick fighting other Citadels of Rick. You're blowing my mind, Aton. <laughs> All right, what All else right. we got? Is that it? Nope. So this is an email from Jeff uh, talking about our discussion of the season premiere where I questioned the ability of Mildew to grow when time is frozen. Anyway, Jeff says, after listening to you talk about how... Uh, there shouldn't be dust or mildew on on Beth and Jerry since time is frozen. I thought I'd offer a possible explanation. Even though time has stopped for the rest of the world, Summer, Morty, and Rick are moving around and can manipulate objects within the time frozen world. Them daily walking by Beth and Jerry could uh, accumulate dust. As to mildew, it depends on how time was frozen. If there were mildew spores on any of Summer, uh, Morty, or Rick, they could have not been time frozen. Then they would just have to land on Beth and Jerry and do their thing. Keep up the great work, Jeff. Yeah. Well, you know, another thing is that Rick and Mor- or Morty, he he takes a shirt off of his dad, puts it back on. So if he touches something, can it un- it's unfrozen in time? Because we're meant to believe that even the shirts or whatever are frozen, but then when he interacts with it, it unfreezes them. So even if Morty is breathing, does that, like, activate all the whatever pathogens or things in the air? I mean, I do think that's a hilarious interpretation of the scene, you know, but I don't think that mildew and stuff is growing everywhere around the world because mildew is still life, right? Like, so it's only on stuff that these three living characters on Earth are I'm just saying when there are these animated people within frozen time, their animation, and I don't mean animated like in the pen and paper way, but in the sense that time is frozen yet they are still moving, but when they interact with objects and also grant them the ability to move, then we have to believe that, oh, even the air that they interact with, I mean, air isn't frozen in time, right? They're still breathing. The air is able to move in and out of their lungs. Isn't it? But but it seems like this emailer is saying that just the air in front of Rick and Morty and Beth, I mean, in summer, is moving and that all other air is frozen. Because well, yeah. you're saying, because basically you're saying the elements are still going on while everything's frozen. But well, then would... if they're nearby uh, Beth and Jerry for a long time, then maybe the air that they are breathing becomes active and then some of these <laughs> passive processes go into right. effect again. Yeah, I think so whatever I think, these guys touch, you know, is kind of activated. I, I like right, that Right, but including idea. what they breathe and, like, all the erosion from them, like, kicking, or, you know, like, stepping on dirt and moving the dirt and stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> all I'm saying is I think their presence might activate some other natural processes in the atmosphere or in the in the air. Throughout, uh, just, at the, just throughout, outside their house, or yeah, or... outside their house or in their immediate vicinity. Okay, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I guess. But like, <laughs> like, like the sun did the the Earth did stop spinning around the sun. We agree on that. Is it always daylight, or did they get into that? Yeah, I think it's always. Daylight. I think it's always daylight. Yeah. Interesting. I still think, like, why is he even changing his shirt? Like, he's not sweating. Well, that's more to my point. All the breathing has, uh, you know, all that breathing has made the air move, and now he's got dust on the shirt. Fuck. All right. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I understand your point, but I'm still angry about it. <laughs> Is that it? All right. Uh, yep. All right. Well, that's going to go ahead and wrap it up for today. So thank you, Ryan and Alec, for joining me. You're welcome. And if you guys have a second, I would really appreciate it if you guys left us a review on iTunes. It really means the world to us. Just take a second, roll up to your computer, put your fingers on the keyboard, and give us a nice review. It really mean the world to us. Uh, where can we find you guys on the internet? Ryan? 
You can find me on Facebook and YouTube at Ryan Shorts and Ryan's Game Show. I released a video called Man Solves Wheel of Fortune Puzzle with One Letter this week. Go watch, go check it out. And Alec? You can find me on Twitter at WisecrackAlec. Cool. And you can find me on Instagram with dog photos at Father of Woody or hit me up at Wisecrack on Twitter. They're works of art. Thank you. That's going to do it for today, guys. Join us next week for Season 2, Episode 3 of Rick and Morty. And until then, see you next time. Wubble of a dub-dub from Hollywood, California. (laughs) 